My name is Chris Costa. I'm the executive director of the International Spy Museum. This is a big milestone for us because we're really kicking off our first program in earnest here this evening. So uh, we're really excited about that in the new museum after we open. So thank you for coming out tonight. I'm excited to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. David Priest, on Vince's right. And of course, Dr. Vince Houghton, author of the new book, book Nuking the Moon, right? While we're here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about David. He is the Chief Operating Officer of the Lawfare Institute and Visiting Fellow at George Mason University's National Security Institute. He served during the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations as a CIA intelligence officer and manager, including a year delivering the PDB, the Presidential Daily Brief, to Robert Mueller and Attorney General John Ashcroft, which is a big deal in the intelligence community to be the deliverer of a PDB, especially at that level. David is no stranger to the International Spy Museum, having appeared here in Vince's position for his own 2016 book, The President's Book of Secrets, The Untold Story of Intelligence Briefings to America's Presidents. But we're all here to hear from Vince Houghton tonight. He is our special guest, and obviously Vince is well known to this community. He is our very own historian and curator here at the Spy Museum. He also is the host and creative director of our podcast, <coughs> SpyCast, which reaches a national and international audience of over 2.5 million listeners each year. And if you haven't checked that out, check out SpyCast. He does a great job on that. Vince is a veteran of the U.S. Army, and he served in the Balkans before receiving his master's and Ph.D. in diplomatic and military history from the University of Maryland. He has appeared on CNN, NBC News, Fox News, NPR, and other major outlets as an expert in intelligence history. His new book, Nuking the Moon and Other Intelligence Schemes and Military Plots Left on the Drawing Board, takes us on a wild tour of missions and schemes that almost happened but were ultimately deemed too dangerous, expensive, ahead of their time, or even certifiably insane. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll turn it over to David to get started, but I want to remind folks to go ahead and check out the books. We have them in the back when you leave. We're selling them at the table. Vince and David are both here uh, and are prepared to sign their books. So. David, go ahead and kick it off. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. you notice Vince and I have different styles for the uh, Lady Gaga mics here. Um, <laughs> I very sound like Justin Bieber. Yeah, I don't even know what love. style I have. For <laughs> I keep mine in the middle. Hope it doesn't fall off my head. It's my style. If it does, then you go down with it. You just talk from the floor. Uh, New King of the Moon. If you haven't already heard about it, you will. It's getting a lot of press already, even though it just came out, and it's got some of the funniest stories you'll ever read about intelligence and military history. We're going to share some of those stories here with you tonight, but not all of them, because that would be giving away too much good material. Uh, nuking the Moon, Vince, even in the introduction to your own book, you write that none of these things actually happened, right? Why write a book about what didn't happen? <laughs> sure, right? I, well, because everyone else has written about history books about stuff that did happen, right? There's nothing left to write about. Um, well, what's interesting about this is intent matters. And there are times when circumstances just go against the program or a policy or technology happening. It has nothing to do with that policy itself. And the war ends. Uh, another technology supersedes it. Uh, you know, someone dies and this doesn't happen. That still matters to us as historians. To understand the intent of these historic actors, it's not like it's Bob down the street. It's JFK, it's Carl Sagan, it's people who are historic names that had some of the ideas that are in this book that only didn't happen because of actions outside of their control. And so it's really interesting for us to try to be able to put ourselves in the mindset of these historic actors. Actually, one of the benefits of not having them actually happen is we're not clouded by historical hindsight. It's very easy for us to look back at history with a 2020 hindsight and Take a look at things like the outcome, like what happened and what happened when it happened. This allows us to get rid of that, because there is no outcome, right? There is no impact to any of these policies. And we can just hunker down on why they were thinking about doing these kind of programs, what was the impetus behind it, what were they thinking, 
And I want everyone, you know, that's very easy to read these stories and go, God, what the hell were these guys thinking? I want you to ask that same question, but in a different way. I want you to go, what were they thinking? What, what led to them to make these decisions? What were they feeling? What were they thinking? Why were they afraid? Because in many cases, these are guys who are terrified of what's going on around them in the world. And that led to, you said it's funny. I didn't mean to write a comedy book. This is not me sitting down trying to be Dave Barry or someone writing a comedy book. It just went that way on its own. Uh, sometimes the material just writes itself. In many cases, these are funny because they're absurd. But they're absurd in a way that we have to take them seriously. So some of the plans are absurd, but you're saying the thinking that got people there right. didn't start in an absurd place. And that's the, that's the key behind this. It's like these are policies that we laugh at today, but were put in place by some of the most serious people in history. And they thought they made a whole lot of sense at the time. And it's only in hindsight that we kind of chuckle at them and say, God, these guys are morons. So I've heard that a lot, right? Even like on Twitter, people read the book like, what a bunch of idiots. I'm like, stop. That's, you missed the point. Go back and read the introduction again. Because these aren't idiots. These are some of the most prominent people in America and Britain around the world who are making decisions that are based on desperation. And so they're making, in some cases, bad decisions. But in some cases, they're making decisions that seem like a really good idea at the time. Maybe we'll leave it up to the audience. Maybe we'll have a vote at the end to see whether these were really idiotic, moronic, absurd, all the words that Vince uses in the book to describe them, whether in fact they actually come out that way. The, the book is divided into sections, and the first section is perhaps the most fun of them all, which are stories involving animals and the cruel things humans do to animals in order to aid espionage efforts. Uh, one of them I could go either way on. You uh, called it fun, which is, yeah, I don't know what... Someone needs to pay attention to you a little bit more. Isn't that the, first, careful with my the first step of a serial killer is cruelty to animals or something like that? I've never heard that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, on the one hand, the first story in the book, the story that Vince opens with, on the one hand, it could be seen as a very clever <coughs> eavesdropping method. The other side of it could be seen as a cruel, mad scientist experiment <coughs> that mangled cats. Tell us about Acoustic Kitty. So I had to start with Acoustic Kitty, and that's the actual technical name for the program. Uh, and this was an attempt in the 1960s by the CIA to find an innovative way of getting covert listening devices close to targets without them being noticed. Uh, part of the technology, technological problem at the time was that covert listening devices weren't particularly good. Actually, maybe they were too good. They picked up everything. So if you put a covert bug on the bottom of a bench, it would pick up birds chirping and dogs barking and people walking by and the air going through and idle chatter from across the park and almost completely muffle the conversation on top of the bench that you're trying to listen into. So the CIA was stymied, like, how do we figure this out? And there's a lot of legend and urban legend in this story, but one of the, one of the legends is that one, a CIA officer in Istanbul, Turkey, watched as stray cats wandered in and out of the Russian, at the time, the Soviet embassy, and no one paid him any attention. They're just little kitties. Sometimes people even reach down and scratch them under the chin and kind of pet them and said, huh, cats can pretty much go anywhere and no one pays them any attention. So why don't we try to turn a cat into a covert listening device? <laughs> and this doesn't mean just kind of staple gunning a microphone <laughs> to the background. That, that would be cruel. That would be cruel. No, this means going and chopping them open and sticking a, a power pack inside their abdomen, <laughs> wiring up the microphone inside their ear canal and turning their tail into the antenna. <laughs> That's Acoustic Kitty. And what's really fascinating, I think this is something that I try to get across, intelligence history is incredibly hard to write. Mm -hmm. And it's not just saying, well, you know, you feel sorry for me because I have to write this stuff. Is that none of the documents out there were written for historians. And some of the documents don't even exist anymore. They've been shredded, they've been burned, <laughs> they've been heavily redacted. And so stories like Acoustic Kitty we don't know the real story, because there are stories about Acoustic Kitty, or they come from people's recollections, and sometimes those recollections are problematic. Victor Marchetti, who is uh, a huge critic of the CIA, is really the one that introduced the world to Acoustic Kitty, um, and his book is just torches the agency. So do we take this with a grain or a pound or a ton of salt? So what do you do as a historian there? It's not just a story in a book. What did you do to dig down and find the truth behind some of these stories? I, the truth is tricky, right? That's a word that really is, is more truthiness in this case, right? The idea is, as long as I'm honest with the reader, and I hope that you see that when, I, when you read this, saying, I have no idea what the story is, but we're going to work on this together. We're going to walk through this 
these different stories together and try to piece this together. So Bob Wallace, who is a member of our board here, he's the former director of the Office of Technical Services at CIA, which is, you know, Q at the agency. Now, Bob came in after the acoustic kitty story. He's, he's not that old, right? He would be like 105 right now if he was head of OTS in 1963. <laughs> Um, it's not a day over 100. Right, exactly. And he doesn't look a day over 95, so it's, it's really aged well. Um, but, but Bob certainly knew all the same people that had worked on this program, because they were, a lot of them were still there. And certainly Bob had access to all the documents and everything that had come beforehand. And Bob swears this story is not true. Now, Bob doesn't argue that there was an acoustic kitty. Right? We have actual document evidence that there was an acoustic kitty program. But he claims that they did the experiment, as far as like cutting the cat open in, in a surgical suite with a veterinarian under anesthesia. You know, everything was sterile. Not that the cat got the volunteer from this, but at least it was better than the other version. It would have been one patriotic cat. And then, yes, and then, as you would expect, they went into difficulty training the thing. If anyone's trying to train a cat, this is not a surprise to you. Um, and the cat just kind of wandered off. You know, the cat would do a little bit what you wanted to, and then would get hungry and kind of wander off. And they just said, this is impossible. Like, there's no way we can do this. Now, Marchetti's version says the same thing. That happened. But this is the same time period that another program at CIA was going on called MKUltra. And people may have heard of MKUltra as the CIA's mind control program, where they experimented with LSD and other hallucinogenics. That's only one small part of MKUltra. MKUltra was actually about 150 different sub-projects. And one of them, we know for a fact, dealt with electric brain stimulation in animals and trying to go around their natural instincts, like when they get hungry. So Marchetti argues, in the main fact, that they went back in to Acoustic Kitty when it wanted off to get food, and they rewired its brain to make it ignore its natural instinct for hunger, or for ignoring us, or for wanting to lick itself, or whatever else. And then it would do what we wanted it to. Uh, and they got all the way to the point where they wanted to do a full-scale live field test of Acoustic Kitty. How did that go? Not so well. Um, I mean, it went well at first, right? The, the great part about this is for the CIA technicians, according to this story, it went as perfect as it could be, right? They went there in their secret spy CIA van. It was the 1960s, right? So maybe it had a little day glow going on up in. And I said, you know, Bob's mechanic on the side. They parked up in Northwest DC, Connecticut Avenue area, and they had two guys just randomly talking on a bench. They're like, that's going to be our test subject. And they clipped all their little 1960s era tech, uh, no, electronics inside, and Acoustic Kitty, you know, kind of ready to go, <laughs> open the van door, put Acoustic Kitty on the ground, hit that one last enter button, and Acoustic Kitty made a beeline straight for the two men sitting on the Sounds bench. like success. It sounds like success. And you can imagine the thought process of these guys were like, oh my god, we pulled this off. <laughs> like, we trained a cat to become a coder listening device. And these are, these are nerdy tech guys, right? So they're... They're thinking about like what kind of motorcycle they're going to buy, right? So they can be cool as operations people. And they're, the delusions of grandeur are going through their head. And maybe they weren't paying enough attention to traffic. Because according to the story, poor Acoustic Kitty, and a lot of you will understand this, got run over by a cab halfway across the street. Uh, and, and so, sad for our, our, our hero, our four-legged hero in this case, um, we have to kind of feel a little bit of empathy for those poor CIA tech guys. And, they're not getting a motorcycle, they're not getting a raise. Now they're getting made fun of even more by the operations guys. Uh, and they've got to go scrape that roadkill off the street because it's not just a dead cat, it's not a dead cat that's sparking and smoking. You know? <laughs> and you've got to get it out there before the Soviets, or God forbid the Washington Post, comes along and finds out what this agency's been up to. This is the kind of stories that are in the book where it's, you know, you've got to be kidding me. They actually did this, right? But the Vince has found the documents to show this, going back in the archives of the CIA or military files, in some cases, and also doing interviews to find out who had access to this kind of material to tell me whether this is all just a, a fake memo in the file. Or something. It's amazing they didn't sell all this stuff on fire. I, I, I actually laughed at this. Like, why did you let this stuff exist? Uh, this would have been the burn, the fastest thing in the burn bag would have been the files about Acoustic Kitty, but no, there's a lot out there. Yeah. It was heavily redacted, but it's enough to kind of put together the pieces that there actually were programs about training live cats sure. to be covert listening to so, them. So let's move away from the house pets. That may be too sensitive for, for some of us. Let's move to other forms of mammals. Um, let's go back a step. Let's talk about intelligence as an as a entry to that. Covert action, depending on its exact purpose, but covert action has to stay secret at least long enough to complete the act. That's step one. If you get to step two, it's a more advanced covert action where 
there's possible deniability. Not only do you complete the action, but you do it in such a way that the target isn't quite sure who did it. And then there's the ultimate, then there's step three, which is not only is there plausible deniability that you did it, but the target isn't even sure that they got hit by something. They don't even know what happened, but something has gone badly for them. This was attempted in World War II in North Africa. Talk a little bit about Stanley Lovell and Goku. Yeah, right, so <laughs> this is actually one of those where you laugh and cringe at the same time because there came a point where the United States almost became the first known country in World War II to use biological weapons. Uh, and that's, again, you know, you go, oh, that's, not, that's a little more serious than we want it to be. Well, fortunately, the biological weapon, for our laughing pleasure, they were going to use a synthetic form of goat manure, goat poop, as a vector for a bioweapon that would make, not kill the German soldiers in North Africa, but basically make them wish they were dead. Uh, Stanley Lovell called it the four horsemen of the apocalypse of different plagues and things where the poor German soldier, and I, I you never hear that phrase come out of my mouth again, would be, I don't even want to get graphic about this, would be the sickest you've ever been times 100. And Lovell, take a step back, Lovell was hired by the OSS, the precursor of the CIA, by Bill Donovan directly. So Donovan was the head of the agency. And he called Lovell in and said, look, I need someone to be my Professor Moriarty. He'd write your Sherlock Holmes, he was seen the TV show or the movies. Moriarty is the evil genius that thwarts Sherlock Holmes at every, every chance he gets. And that's what Donovan was looking for, the guy to pull out all the dirty tricks. Not the one to make the you know, little spy gadgets like we have here in the museum, not the one to make the covert listening devices, the one to make the German army uh, feel really badly about themselves, right? The ones to think of assassination tools and dirty tricks and things like that. So Lovell was the perfect guy for the job. The idea behind this was that Lovell took a look at how can we possibly slow down the German army in North Africa. And this is a time, talk about desperation. This is a time when the United States had just first entered World War II. The battle of Operation Torch in North Africa and more importantly, there's a battle called Kazarine Pass, where we went in there thinking, yeah, let's go take on the Germans, right? Johnny going over there, and we got flat. This was one of the worst defeats in U.S. military history, and continues to be one of the worst defeats in U.S. <coughs> military history. And all of a sudden, it looked as though we weren't ready to fight this war. And the people like Franklin Roosevelt and others, who had been vehemently against any kind of bio or chemical warfare, all of a sudden were like, well, like, if the war's going to go this way, we've got to kind of figure out a different way to do it. So they gave Lovell, through Donovan, the permission to check out a potential idea. And the idea was this. There are a lot of goats in North Africa. There are a lot of horse flies in North Africa. Horse flies are, I mean, horse flies are attracted to goat poop, like a thing. Yeah, anyway. Uh, I mean, you can, you can figure that using the S word that I won't use. Um, and... The fact that that is a key component to all this meant that you could create a vector for a biological attack. And in doing so, the OSS wasn't going to take any chances. So Lovell sat down and said, okay, we want to make sure these flies are attracted to this goat poop. So they created a, a fly pheromone and they implanted inside the goat poop to the point where, according to Lovell, it would wake up North African flies from hibernation. <laughs> it would be like the aroma of a cinnamon, right? Where, it, 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 and, yeah, and for North, for North African flies, who just flocked to this kind of stuff. They just picked this stuff up and then went straight for one of two things. One is mucous membranes. They love to land in your eyes, your mouth, and your nose, or your food. So if you can lace this synthetic goat poop, this super duper aroma of wonderful synthetic goat poop, with all these biological toxins, the flies will do the work for you. They'll land on it, they'll fly back, they'll land on the German food, they'll land on the German's eyes and mouth, and all of a sudden the entire German army is in a hospital. Did anybody see any potential problems with this? Sure, right, so this is a name that we'll never know, and it's sad because this is somebody who had the courage, probably somebody sitting in the back of the conference room, and said, um, Dr. Lovell, uh, we're going to have to airdrop this synthetic goat poop all over Spanish Morocco, where this operation was. The problem there is there's a lot of flat-roofed houses in Spanish Morocco, which means about half the goat poop's going to land on the roofs of these houses in Spanish Morocco, unless the OSS is going to genetically engineer flying goats. And we've got a real problem in explaining 
That's how the goat poop got on the roof. That's, 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 that's where plausible deniability kind of goes out the window a little bit. Yeah. But it was a perfect plan except for that little part of it. Mm -hmm. What ended up happening, again, this is not something where Roosevelt kind of came to his senses. This is not something where Bill Donovan, who was the most decorated soldier in American history, said, no, we're not going to use a biological weapon. This was planned and ready to be put into operation. But thankfully, the Germans uh, ran into a dead end in Stalingrad. They ran into the brick wall of the Soviet Red Army and had to pull their troops out of Spanish Morocco to go reinforce the failed operation to try to take Stalingrad. And that's why this plan was scrapped. Again, it wasn't because we said, no, we don't want to be the first country to use biological weapons. No, we don't want to get beyond this whole covert action problem of goat poop on the ceilings or on the roofs. It's because there was no need for it anymore. And that's one of the extraordinary things about this book is that, to me, I mean, even writing it and reading it and researching it, was that very rarely was there someone who kind of came to their senses and said, boy, this is a wacky plan. In most cases, it only didn't happen because of some other event that had nothing to do with the plan itself. So let me push you on this. Uh, most of you don't know, Dr. Vince Houghton is not a fan of what historians call counterfactuals, which is when you take what happened in history and you do the what if game. You know, what if Hitler had been blown up by the, the bomb, the, the assassination attempt? Or what if Cleopatra's nose had been longer? How would have history played out differently? He hates those questions. Vince, what if, what if, in fact, the Germans had stayed in North Africa a little bit longer? Would this plan based on your best historical magic, would this plan have been put into effect? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think that the, the we didn't have a way to beat the German army in North Africa until Patton got there, which was a couple weeks later. Uh, and Patton had to not only get there, but he had to get the troops ready. And the combination of Patton's army and Montgomery's British army are what finally pushed Rommel back. And actually a combination of those two factors and the ability to break the German Enigma machine and stop the supplies from flowing across the Mediterranean. So this was a weeks, if not months long process to slow down the German army in North Africa. That's what finally wins that battle. And if it wasn't for the fact that Rommel and the Germans pulled out a lot of their forces to deal with what was happening in Stalingrad, and more importantly, they stopped putting more in, right? There was a fear that the, 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 the Spanish army, the Spanish army would join the Axis side that Spain under Franco who was already fascist, but neutral, at least nominally neutral, would join the fascist cause, and all of a sudden Spanish Morocco would be a headquarters where the Germans could pour troops into North Africa. None of that happens because the Red Army gives Hitler everything he can handle in Stalingrad. But if that doesn't happen, if Stalingrad falls, and all of a sudden North Africa becomes a battleground, North Africa is just a bunch of sand. Well, it's the route to the Middle East, guys, right? It's, it's how you get to all that oil, the, the gas station in the Middle East. And so we had to take it seriously. And as possible, we would never have allowed it to fall into the hands of the Germans and biological warfare could have been that, that solution. Yeah. Let's go to the other theater in World War II before we finish out the animal portion of the program. <laughs> um, as, as the war was nearing a close, it was obvious that Japan was not surrendering. Something would have to be done dramatic to get them to surrender. Eventually, we know what happened because history, right? There was a nuclear weapon. Actually, two. That's the way it works. Well, guess what? Before then, there was another plan that did not involve nuclear weapons. It involved a friendly, patriotic American bat being used as a bomb. Um, tell, us, tell us about bat bombing and how the plan was almost put into practice, and perhaps more sadly, how it was tested. So this is a plan that actually the, the creator of this argued to his deathbed that it would have killed less Japanese than the two atomic bombs. Now, that's debatable. Um, but he, till the day he died, was like, he should have gone my way. Because I could have ended the war and we would have massacred less the Japanese than the US. It was a dentist, of all people, uh, an inventor named Lytle Adams. And Adams was on vacation, driving back in the southwest United States in New Mexico, when on the radio, like so many others, on December 7, 1941, heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor. And immediately, somehow, magically, he had this epiphany of how he could help the Americans win the war. He had just spent time in these caverns out in the southwest United States where it was just huge bat population, just thousands if not millions of bats. And just kind of something light bulb went off. This is, he was a tinkerer anyway, so he had all these ideas that bats, like 
dry, warm, dark places. They are almost guaranteed to find one of those if you put them into the wild, certainly when they want to go to sleep. In Japan, most of Japan is made of either wood or paper buildings. So if you combine those two things in an incendiary device, A plus B plus C equals you burn Japan to the ground. The idea was that you can affix incendiary devices to bats, drop bats over Japan, they would find their ways into the houses and homes and attics and eaves and nooks and crannies of these Japanese houses, and then the incendiary device would go off and burn it and burn it all. Uh, with the, you know, poor bats would, would go down in history as, as true American heroes, uh, but we'd lose a whole lot less soldiers in the process. Um, they did a lot of testing for this. This is one of the ones where uh, there's a lot of information out there and a, a lot of documents about the process this went through and the testing. This was actually passed from one military branch to another, right? So it was, it was so thought of as a potentially good idea that multiple military branches tested this and put a lot of money into it. And um, it almost came to fruition. Eventually, when it finally made its way to uh, being kind of finally signed off on by a top American naval admiral, he said, this doesn't make any sense. Why would we do this? There's, a, there's another thing going on in New Mexico right now that's going to end the war without meeting hundreds of thousands of bats. But before it got to that level, there were a lot of people that had a lot of real interest and trying to pull off this operation. It eventually was called Project X-Ray. It didn't really have a name before that. It was kind of the Adams Project before that. Uh, but some of the testing is extraordinary. Um, and poor bats, uh, what they did was they went to these caves, and they collected these bats in these big nets, and then they had to actually bring them maybe 10, 15, 20, something to 100 miles to where they actually the test site. So they put them into hibernation. So they put them into cool like trucks um, to kind of make them go to sleep. And then the idea was you, you warm them up a little bit and you attach the incendiaries to them. And then you'd be able to use them in a test. Well, the first time, they didn't warm them up enough. And when they brought them up into the plane to drop them, all the bats were still asleep. Uh, and I don't care if you got wings, and I don't care how aerodynamic you are. If you're dead asleep, you hit the ground just as hard as the rest of us do. And so the poor bats in the first test, uh, rest in peace. Um, the second ones are like, we're not going to make that mistake again. We're going to make sure that these bats are awake so they can actually be part of this operation. So the next test near an airfield, a real working airfield that had no idea what was going on right next to them, um, they said, we're going to bring them out of hibernation earlier. They brought them out too early. So when they opened the doors of the truck, the bats all flew out in every single direction. The problem was they'd already been affixed with their cigarette devices. And what do bats do? Well, the good news is they went to the test city they built, and they burned it to the ground. That's the good news. The bad news is they went to the airfield the U.S. Army was using, and they burned that to the ground also. The commander of the airfield, who had not been briefed whatsoever on what was going on, is watching his airfield burn and trying to get in with his fire crew. And he didn't have the need to know, so they didn't even let him inside his own airfield. And that was a bit of a speed bump. Um, and so at that point, the Army was like, no, no we're not going to do this anymore. The program was almost canceled. But what they didn't know was that there's a Marine general that had been watching this. And, and if, if you know Marine generals like I do, he's probably laughing at that. Watching this airfield burn the ground. And fortunately, he said, look, this is a great program. The Marines are the ones that are going to be fighting and dying during this island hopping campaign. Let's, let's have the Marine Corps and the Navy put some money into this, and let's see if we can actually weaponize it. And that's when it becomes Project X-Ray, which is what it's named in the book. And then it's tested again. They actually, they perfect it. They get it to the point where it is fully operational. And they just need to scale it up. And to scale it up, they need money. And when they went and asked for money from the Chief of Naval Operations, again, he said, what? what? <laughs> I know there's some kind of experiment going on in New Mexico, but that's not the one I was thinking of. And so he canceled the program because, of course, at that point, the Trinity test had actually happened already, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki came there not shortly thereafter. How do you research this? How do you find out all of those parts of that story by, what, digging in old file folders? You dig. And, and actually, I made a conscious decision in this book not to force a reader who wants to know more about this to have to go to an archive. So there are actual documents in parts of the story that I did include on purpose. What I try to do in the back of the book is, for every single story in here, I give you where you can go find more. Whether it's a public library, online, 
things that you can do that doesn't mean going to College Park to the National Archives. And I actually chose stories with that in mind. So there are stories that are maybe even wackier than some of these, but they're only in the archives. And I didn't want to create a book where people couldn't, if each chapter is only 12 pages or something like that, right? It's a, it's a quick hit. It's a bit like this museum where the idea is you want to spur thought-provoking questions. You want to make people want to know more about these things. And there's no point in making people want to know more about these stories if they can't go and learn more about these stories, if they've got to go to an archive. So I purposely chose things that people could research on their own. Now, fortunately, some very nice people have scanned hundreds of thousands of top secret, now class declassified documents online. And there are whole databases online where information about some of these projects exists. You're talking about officially declassification, right. not a WikiLeaks type situation. No, no, right, yes, yes. <laughs> official declassification yeah. in most cases, um, mm -hmm. where people have been nice enough mm -hmm. to actually scan this. So you can sit home on your computer and look at a lot of these programs, a lot of the documents behind this, mm -hmm. and not necessarily have to go into it. Now, the Project X-Ray one, we're fortunate in that case because one of the participants in the actual operation ended up writing a memoir. Mm -hmm. And in that, there's a lot of information about this operation. One of the operations <laughs> you write about in the book, thankfully, starts to involve people instead yes. of hapless animals. Um, this was one of the most secret projects of the Cold War, but we know a good deal about it because some of the documents were declassified just a few years ago. And I'm going to read an excerpt from the book to describe the kind of person that this project was explicitly looking for. This was a Cold War story, so this was a contingency. What happened if the Soviet Union invaded Alaska, occupied Alaska, how would we collect intelligence in that occupied territory? Well, one way you do it is you have a group of people left behind who are trained to collect intelligence in that environment. And here's the kind of person that an actual document Vince found said is eminently satisfactory for the job. Right, I love that. It's basically, this is good enough. This is good enough. He's a professional photographer. He has only one arm. <laughs> and it is felt that he would not benefit the enemy in any labor battalion as a result. He is also an amateur radio operator. He is licensed as a hunting or fishing guide. And he's well versed in the art of survival. He is a pilot of small aircraft, reasonably intelligent, particularly crafty, and possessed of sufficient physical courage, as is indicated by his offer to guide a party which was to have hunted Kodiak bear armed only with bow and arrow. <laughs> this was somebody who was satisfactory, satisfactory for the job. I don't know how you hunt bow and arrow with one arm. I mean, it's like one of these things. <laughs> what's, what's the story behind what's in here called Project Wash Tub? This is one of the great ones because literally in 2014, I believe, they dumped 10,000 documents on us. And this was not I mean, completely, this was only half declassified. Right, so there's stuff heavily redacted. There's still parts of this that you just can't get. But this was not a wing nut plan that somebody crafted in their basement. J. Oh. Edgar Hoover at the FBI was involved. This is a combination FBI plan and the Air Force Office of Special Op Investigations are operations now. And actually, the head of that program goes on to become the first DIA director. So these are real people. Um, decided the fear at the time was that there would be a Red Dawn style invasion of Alaska. And there would have to be people there available to be call state lines. Essentially, they would kind of drift back into the countryside during the invasion, and then when the Soviets got comfortable, they would either do paramilitary operations, do sabotage operations, they would collect intelligence, they would do all the things necessary to make the Soviets' life a living hell in Alaska, much in the same way the French Resistance and the OSS and the SOE did during World War II. And this project, actually, they started training people. So this wasn't one that was scrapped right away. This was one where they put, we don't know how many, but they put at least dozens of people through a training regimen that sounds very similar to what you would get at the farm at CIA. They learn everything from code making and code breaking to languages to uh, all the sabotage, paramilitary operations, weapons, how to do dead drops, how to do signals, all the things you learn how to do, they went through this. And again, this is, these are like the one-armed bear hunters that are going through this project, this operation. And the names that I have, that, that's like, I actually have real file card profiles of real people that were brought into this program, and every one of them is straight out of Hollywood central casting. There's not a single normal one otherwise. It's not like Bob was an accountant. No, it's all of them like has four cabins and has been had married seven times and has bears on his wall. And, and every one of them, you're like, where are these people coming from? Well, apparently in the 1950s in Alaska, everyone was bear gorillas, right? Everyone was like, eating, you know, squirrels by the side of the road with no cooking or anything. And 
The crazy part is, these are only the ones that have been declassified. The roster has twice as many classified, already still redacted names as the ones I have. So these are the normal ones we're finding out about. And so this operation goes on for several years. I mean, it doesn't actually happen, but the training for it goes on. The FBI pulls out eventually because Hoover's like, if any word of this gets out, we're going to look like laughing stocks. At this point, the FBI couldn't afford to do that. But the Air Force Special Operations Special Investigations Unit carries this all the way up until basically 1960, when it became very obvious, and again, this is, it wasn't scrapped, this was a bad idea, it became very obvious that any World War III would be nuclear weapons doing this, and not a Red Dawn-style invasion of Alaska. Um, but some of the, again, these people, uh, that's the great part about this, is right, I only really took these stories from a maybe five or six hundred pages of these documents. Right, I kind of hunker down, and this might sound like a lot, but in, in this world, it's not, right? Out of 10,000. So there's so much out there that I read, but I didn't really kind of hunker down on. And it's really about like a day to day train, day to day operations. It's just really fascinating. And if you really want to dig deep, they're out there and they're all online. Vince, you mentioned nuclear weapons, and that's your true love. That's how you started into this area, was investigating nuclear weapons and being fascinated by you them. You love hurting animals. Yeah. I love <laughs> nuclear weapons. We're a great pair <laughs> There was a problem that we had during the Cold War, which is once the Soviets were able to target our nuclear missiles well enough that they had a good chance of taking them out before they could launch, that's a dangerous time. That, that makes deterrence much harder. Um, so audience participation time. What are some ways, if you think the Soviet Union can launch nuclear weapons at our nuclear weapons and hit them before they can launch? What are some ways to get around that? How can you make the missiles more useful? Mobile. Mobile, how? Trains. Put them on trains. Other ideas? Bats. What's that? More bats. 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 That would be amazing. Close the bat gap. Right. OK, other than trains. Submarines, planes. Yep. Sub submarine trains, planes, submarines. Right, sounds like a movie. <laughs> yeah. What did we do, Vince? How did we try to make, in particular, the MX more mobile? See, the MX was a missile that was going to replace the Minuteman III. This is, it, it sounds wonky. In the 1980s, we built a new missile called Missile Experimental. It kind of crunched down the MX. It was known as the Peacemaker or the Peacekeeper. Talk about the most euphemistic name for a, a, a multi-megaton weapon that would kill millions if it was used in battle. Um, the problem was it was a ground-based missile. And by the 1970s and 1980s, ground-based missiles were sitting ducks. Um, we actually call them the nuclear sponges because they just sop up the attack from the bad guys. And they just kind of, if you live in North Dakota or if you live in Kansas, you know, sorry because you're going to get targeted by about 500 or 1,000 nuclear weapons because your little silos down the street are going to be a major target. It's called counterforce. You want to take out their missiles on the ground, or they want to take our missiles out on the ground before we launch. The way we got around this was what's called the nuclear triad. We had air-based nuclear weapons, bombers. We had sea-based nuclear weapons and submarines, and then we had the ground-based ones. So if they took one of them out, maybe one of the legs or two of the legs of the triad will still exist. The issue was you couldn't just give up one of them. And in the case of the Minuteman III in permanent silos, you basically were saying, go ahead and take them out. Because they were not hardened enough to withstand a massive nuclear weapon. And they weren't mobile at all. They were just kind of sitting there. And it's not like they were secret. You ever drive through Nebraska, and in an empty field, you look out, and there's a fenced-in concrete slab with a sign on it saying, trespassers will be shot. That's not like a workout basketball court. Those are nuclear missile silos. You don't need to be James Bond to figure out where they are. So they knew where everything was. They had them all targeted. So how do you keep these new missiles that we're going to spend billions of dollars on safe? So the Pentagon was asked this question. And as they tend to do, they did studies. And they had a study that came back. And it's one of those, it looks really official. Does it look really official? It is a stack of possible ways to keep the MX missiles safe. MX basing modes. And some of them are straightforward. Some of them are hard in the silos and just try to ride out the storm. Some of them are not so simple. Some of them include put them on hovercrafts and have them zoom across the western United States, which there's no way this would have worked, but you know, you know there was some colonel or general like, we gotta put them on hovercrafts. <laughs> and the lieutenant was like, sir, that's not gonna work. Like, yeah, shut up, lieutenant. The testing it would have been fun. Yeah, testing it would have been fun. And there are projects, these all have great names, like Project Hydra. 
Project Hydra called for basically giving our MX missiles water wings, like a baby has, and it's having them float out in the middle of the ocean and kind of bob along <laughs> until we needed to launch them against the Soviet Union. And the idea was if you, if you put them on a ship and just kind of chuck them over the side right. in haphazard ways, the Soviets would never know where they were. They would never be able to target them. And you know they would never be able to stop us from hitting them first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what about shipping lanes? Sure. Or pleasure boats, or people right. swimming, or um, and the, the, that does that was a problem. They, they at least acknowledged that as an issue. They kind of talk about you know they're like pros. Uh, it'd be hard to find and pros. You know these are things that like you know we have control over the con. You know, forget the Titanic, right? If, if the Carnival cruise line runs into the five megatons of their weapon in the ocean, that could Or even worse, if someone finds them, and you know, a Somali pirate or the IRA or someone else pulls up and says, "Ooh, I'm now a nuclear power," <laughs> and kind of picks up and puts it on the ship. So there was a, a kind of an addendum to that. Like, all right, well, what if we attach them to the seabed floor? It'd be much harder for people to just go grab them. Most pirates aren't on right, the seabed floor, right? And most yeah. you know, ships aren't going along, and yeah. it would be essentially like, if you see those Nat Geographic ones with the big worms right on the floor, it'd be kind of a big missile on the floor. The problem was, if it's under thousands of feet of, of ocean, we can't communicate with it. That's a problem. That's a problem. So in a con section of this plan, it's like, we may not be able to launch these missiles. Um, so that might be an issue. Uh, and the key is they couldn't communicate with it, even test it, right? They couldn't even talk to it. So if World War III started, maybe we have MX missiles, maybe we don't. Uh, that was an issue also. And then someone mentioned trains. There was an idea of just kind of running them around the country on choo-choo trains. Mm -hmm. um, I live in Crystal City. Every night at 2 in the morning, don't ask me why I'm awake. We just built a museum. Um, mm -hmm. Trains go by, and I can imagine just big MX missiles <laughs> starting to fall um, And that would be problematic for me. Uh, there's no <laughs> idea of putting them on the back of flatbed trucks and just having them drive along the interstate highways. Oh, also right. a bit of an issue. Um, there was a call for, if you don't want them driving through your city, to dedicate federal land so they can kind of be on four-wheel drive type vehicles to drive out in the middle of nowhere. Right? There's a lot of land out in Arizona and Utah. And the the they would just drive around the areas where there's not a lot of people. They did a study and they found they would need an area the size of the UK to do this. Um, there's land out there, there's not quite that much land. Uh, and so it ended up, after spending hundreds of millions of dollars of research money, uh, that they decided just to stick them in the ground. <laughs> where they were in the first place. Where they were in the first place. <laughs> and they said, well, we have all these Minuteman 3 silos, let's just shove the MX missile into the ground. And even then, it, it, it's so anticlimactic, because by the time they figured this out, the Cold War ended. And the Stark Treaties came through, and the MX was phased out. Yeah. So we went through this huge process of all these different ideas, all these different challenges, only to have a missile that we didn't need anymore. You make that sound so depressing. Yeah, yeah, the Cold War ended without a shot. So right, exactly. Right, a direct shot. Um, we're going to take some questions now, because you might want to know about some other stories. You might want to try to come up with a crazier story than Vince found. And he'll probably tell you, no, I found that one, too. Or I'm going to write that in a sequel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nuking so, Mars. Yes, Nuking yeah. Mars. So Amanda and Sean are going to have mics, so since we're recording this, just wait for them to come to you. Do you have a question? Anyone? Sean, sure. I've got a question. Oh. Hi, I was curious about uh, the tone of the book. Did you ever struggle with writing and, you know, maybe making it too flippant? How did you strike <laughs> that balance? Yeah, so there's, um, there's a couple tough chapters in here where I had to kind of take back a step of kind of how snarky I was. Um, I actually, I had, my, my editor is, is right down there. I don't know if he wants to acknowledge himself or not. Um, <laughs> see. Uh, and we had a lot of conversations about finding the right balance. Because there's a chapter or two in here where it, there's not a lot of fun. It, it's actually very, very depressing. Um, but at the same time, if I took it too seriously, I would almost be absurd. These are absurd ideas. You kind of need to give them the same kind of uh, tone that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, I I've told these stories like in a setting, like at the museum. And I don't, my personality is just not to take things all that seriously. And so it really just came down to, look, I'll let the material take me in that direction. If it's ridiculous, I'll let it go in that direction. If it's more serious, I'll try to pull it back a little bit. Even if there's one chapter called Operation Northwoods, which is 
the more serious one. It's about the United States government calling for potential terrorist attacks in the United States. Um, in Miami, uh, where I'm from, where my parents went to college. And so I had to, I mean, it's very serious, but I had to put it back to the future reference there. Right? I mean, it's, it's, if they blew up my parents, I know exactly what was going to happen to me, so I take this personally. I don't care how serious it is, it's just asking, it was demanding for it. Well, the balance I tried to strike was between the chapters themselves, and I think you can attest to this, the introduction and the conclusion are pretty serious. Because it's not just 21 fun chapters, but I try to make it, what does this say about the people at the time? What is the, you laugh, but what does it tell us about what these guys were thinking? And guys, it's, it's almost predominantly guys. Um, there's another wonderful counterfactual, like, well, if women were in charge, would they come? Yeah, probably. Um, well, the, that was good historical analysis. Right, that was, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it saves a lot of pages. Um, but the introduction and conclusion actually, I think, balances the tone. Because I wanted to make sure that we are able to step back and look at this. We've now done a lot of laughing by reading the chapters, but can we put ourselves in the shoes of these, these decision makers and policy makers? And that's where you kind of get a little bit more of the serious side. And I'll let you know that whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, you decide. But the tone in reading the book, it's almost like hearing Ben tell the story himself. It, it does have those interjections and bits of humor. In fact, if you get the audio book, you have to hear Ben's humor. <laughs> well, yes, he, he read his own book. Well, there's a, there's a funny thought. Sam and I, my daughter, had a, had a conversation a couple times about where I would literally go off on a tangent for like seven pages. And I was just like, I just kept going. He's like, get rid of all this, get rid of all this. I'm like, but it's so good. It's such good material. It's like, it has nothing to do with it. And that's, that's how I talk, right? I tell stories and I just go off in directions. I, I still have some of that, right? There are times when I, I reference pop culture, or when I reference you know, modern music, like Clash, where I do a lot of movie references. I don't think I reference a single spy movie. The Clash isn't modern anymore. I wasn't referencing Bach, so it's modern enough. Um, and, you know, you talk about spy pop culture, there may be just one reference to spy pop culture in there, and only because literally there's a chapter that a Bond movie was made replicating. Um, but for the most part, this is just me talking. And you're reading almost a transcription of me telling these stories out loud. A lot of them are first person. A lot of, tell, a lot of these were written in first person because to me, that's the narrative, right? It's they're just great stories. <coughs> Other questions? There's a couple down here. Um, thank you. I've read the book, and uh, it's excellent. Thank um, you. One of the chapters that I really enjoyed was your chapter talking about the ways that the U.S. government tried to kill Castro, at least thought of trying to kill Castro. And that differed from some of the others in that some of the plans actually were tried. And my question as I read it was that it seemed like a lot of the things that they tried the Cubans and the Russians knew about beforehand, but yet we went ahead and tried them anyway. And, and, and my question to you as I, I, I thought as I read it is, how did all of this get out there? And if it was so obvious that, that they knew about it, that it was on radio or whatever, why did, why did we keep going? Well, it's a really interesting question. There's a defector in the 1980s who came over, <coughs> maybe late 80s, early 90s, that came over to the United States from Cuba. And let us know for the very first time that every single source we thought we had in Cuba since the 1960s was actually a double agent mm -hmm. that had been feeding back disinformation to the United States. And pound for pound, the DGI, which is what it used to be called now, it's called the DI, Cuban Intelligence, is the greatest intelligence agency in the world. Now granted, they only have one enemy, us. So it's very easy for them to kind of do what they're doing. But they turned every single asset we thought we had for almost three decades. So that's how we got our butts handed to us during that time period. So yeah, they knew everything that was coming. Now they also heavily infiltrated the exile community. There, it's hard to count, uh, but certainly after the Mariel boat lift in 1980, the, the, there's some statistics that suggest that two out of every 10, I know that's one out of every five, but I don't believe the one five thing, so between one and two out of every 10 exiles was actually a Cuban intelligence officer in Miami. So you know what, good luck trying to execute any kind of operation against Cuba during this time period. So sure, Fidel knew they were coming. In many cases, he uh, realized they were so absurd they weren't going to work anyway. 
Uh, there are times where the plans that could have potentially worked were thwarted by people saying, I'm not going to be that guy. The great example of this is James Donovan, not Bill Donovan from OSS, James Donovan, who Tom Hanks played in Bridge of Spies. After he negotiated the release of Francis Gary Powers, he was asked to go down to Cuba to negotiate the release of the Bay of Pigs survivors who had been taken prisoner. The CIA tried to give him a botulism laced wetsuit that to give as a gift to Fidel Castro because he was an avid scuba diver. And he said, no, no, I'm not doing this. Right? That might actually work. Uh, but in this case, he said, I'm not going to do this. He bought his own wetsuit, gave it to him. And actually, that's why Castro was willing to release a lot of the prisoners. So there were times when maybe something could have worked, but most of this is Keystone Cop stuff. Now, how do we know about it? Well, we know about it because of the Church Pike Committee hearings. Because in 1975, both the House and the Senate had hearings on CIA shenanigans. Not just CIA, intelligence community shenanigans that happened specifically in the 50s and 60s during the free-for-all Wild West times of the CIA. And a lot of this stuff came out during those hearings. There's people like William Harvey, who was one of the, one of the models for James Bond. He was an assassin for CIA. Uh, was pulled in front of these committees and basically had to walk through a lot of those proposals. Edward Lansdale, who is infamous or famous, depending on who you ask. Max Boot just wrote a very good book about Lansdale, <coughs> if you want to know more about him. He was actually the architect of one of the Cuba chapters in this book, Operation Northwoods. But he was also somebody that was involved in trying to kill Castro a lot. Uh, he was dragged in front of the committees and had to kind of spill his guts. So we know a lot about it because of that, because a lot of it is declassified because of those hearings. The Cubans knew about it because they had a or lunch. They, they owned us for a long time. Um, why do we keep trying? Because, because we had a communist nation 90 miles from Key West. You couldn't just stop. You had to keep trying. It was not something we could allow to happen, even especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis, especially after, let's get a little quasi-political without getting political, as important as Florida is to national elections. You have to keep trying. Uh, and so that's why, to this day, there's Cuba policy that you kind of scratch your heads at uh, if you keep it objective. Other questions, please? I've got one. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. You're dying, but okay. <laughs> that's quick. Um, so I have a, a question about um, if you you take these kind of crazy ideas and you consider them as crazy in retrospect at the time, you know, they're crazy. They were probably crazy then, too. But how much of that do you have to put up with? Because, like, the things that did work were actually still pretty crazy in retrospect, too. Like, who would have ever thought that putting a camera in space right. would be a thing in the 1960s that we would have pursued and, and accomplished? So, like, how much of that do you actually have to have to deal with when you foster a community of <coughs> supporting thinking out of the box, I guess? Is well, and that's key is that sometimes that when we're looking at these programs, we only think that they're absurd because they don't happen. Right? The SR-71, which is still to this day to be the most beautiful aircraft ever made, it leaks when it's on the ground. It leaks fuel before it takes off. Because when it reaches altitude and it's going really, really fast, all the friction is building up, the heat seals the, the actual fuel tanks of the SR-71. Who the hell thought of that? You know it was not at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday. You know it was at 3 in the morning at some bar. You know, in somewhere. I mean, it, that, that is a crazy idea. And of course, if in testing that had blown up an SR-71, we wouldn't be talking about that as an aircraft. That would have been a dismal failure, but it worked. And it's just as crazy as some of these ideas. And again, that's why I try to emphasize the idea. These, these aren't failed plans. These aren't failed operations. These aren't failed technologies. They never had a chance to fail. They never had a chance to succeed. <coughs> and, and counterfactually, it kind of gets tricky. But if you force me to, I look at some of these and say, yeah, that would have worked. They just never had a chance to try. And so that, that's where it's just kind of history in hindsight is kind of providing us with something. I, I even say it in the book, when I talk about hindsight history, if on January, during the planning for D-Day, basically, you know, six months before the, the 75th anniversary of D-Day, in January, when they're doing the, like, the six month before plans, they laid everything out, they thought, okay, we have Omaha Beach and Silver Beach and Sword and everything else, and they thought, we got a perfect plan. And they kind of signed off and then they started rehearsing it. So you get to June 5th, 1944. If they launched the operation and a freak storm sweeps through and all the landing craft ended up going the wrong way and a bunch of them sink and we lose that battle, 
end up losing that war? Was Eisenhower's plan all of a sudden stupid because a freak accident pops up? Well, from Outcome History Foundation, which is kind of what we do in history, sure, yeah, it fails. But if we're kind of honest about it, the plan's just the same plan as it was before. And that's where we don't care about outcomes as much as we should. Um, or some historians would argue, I don't. I think it's fun to look at intent. I think it's fun to look at the planning that went into these operations. Even if they didn't happen, the, kind of the, the way to get to that end point is what's really interesting to me as a historian. He's dying, he's dying. <laughs> It's fine. Uh, uh, great presentation. Uh, if I may, two questions. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for any of these uh, crazy plans, did uh, Soviets learn about any of them and what kind of response they had? Or had they had any uh, crazy ideas of their own which failed? And second question, um, any of these uh, plans, were they, uh, did you come across any examples when they were shelved and then revived like long time after, like a decade later or two decades later, and why? Yeah, because that would be very interesting. Yeah, so the, the first question about did the Soviets have anything similar to this, actually the, 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 the title of the book references a chapter where we almost had the exact same plan as the Soviets did, uh, without knowing about it, right? We all kind of very had parallel operations going on to try to have this huge demonstration of power by detonating a thermonuclear weapon on the moon. And the Soviets had the same idea that we did. Uh, and we were reacting to Sputnik, and they were reacting to what they thought our reaction to Sputnik was gonna be. And fortunately for both countries, that plan was scrapped on either side, but they literally had the exact same idea we did. Let's blow up the moon, uh, blow up the moon, blow up a nuclear weapon on the moon along the Terminator, which is where the light side and the dark side of the moon meet up, so that you would see the beautiful mushroom cloud although you wouldn't have a mushroom cloud on the moon, that's a whole problem. Uh, there's no atmosphere there, so you're not gonna have a mushroom cloud. One of the reasons that program didn't work out all that well. Uh, so they had a very similar idea. It had nothing to do with intelligence. It's not because they were spying on us and said, we need to do this also. It's that kind of, you know, thousands of miles apart. There were scientists and engineers that came with the same idea at the same time and decided it was a way to go. Um, there were, I mean, anytime you have operations that are, especially the technology chapter in this book, which focus on things like drone technology and large, massive construction projects, like building the Deep Underground Command Center, which is this huge, they call the duck, this huge bunker here in Washington, D.C. The Soviets are gonna catch wind of it. Uh, there's actually a chapter in this where the Soviets knew about it before it even started. And that's Operation Monopoly, which was the building of the tunnel under the, Russian, the Soviet embassy, now Russian embassy here in Washington, D.C. Robert Hansen, the FBI agent turned Soviet spy, told them about it before it even started. And so they just let it keep getting built because they're sitting there going, oh, we don't want to burn Robert Hansen. Uh, but it got to a point where uh, it was not even worth doing anymore because literally the Soviets knew about it before most of the people working on it knew about it. Uh, and that's the, the risk you run with some of these projects which are uh, they're pretty big. These are big thinking. You know, there's no little, little ideas in this. These are big, bold ideas and sometimes big, bold ideas leave a big, big wake behind them. Does that make sense? Um, what was the second? Oh, that was the Yeah, that was the second question. Were there any plans that were revived later on? Oh, revived later on. So, not that we know of. Uh, if, it's, if it's much more recent, the chances are it's still classified. Um, actually, even kind of hint at that in the, the conclusion that, you know, in 20, 30 years, maybe we'll know if some of these plans were revived. I think there are, there are ideas that came in different ways, in different forms. Uh, most of the ideas in this book, and the reason I don't call them failures, not only because they never were allowed to get to the point of failing, but so many interesting ideas and technologies spurred off of these. Uh, the tag board, which was a supersonic drone that actually was put on the back of an SR-71 and launched off the back. That was the impetus for a lot of early drone technology that the CIA would pick up later on. And even like MKUltra, <coughs> as horrible as it was, gave us a better understanding of the human mind that later on we would come into play when we think about Alzheimer's research, and dementia research, and Parkinson's and stuff like that. Things like Acoustic Kitty itself really kind of provides us with a lot of understanding of animal research. The guy who worked very closely on the Bat Bomb project actually created, uh, figured out the idea of echolocation in bats. And what became later on, ironically enough, one of the most uh, strong, the strongest advocates for animal consciousness. 
the idea that animals are actually thinking and feeling and you know all that. And, and that to me is interesting uh, because these are programmed like I mean that's how that's how technology works. That's how science works. A lot of times it's a failure and or a dead end that leads us to learn something about what not to do. And a lot of these policies are about what not to do uh, and led us to a better place. But because we don't know if any of these plans have been revisited, stay away from the Goku. And <laughs> <laughs> the cats, the bats, and everybody else. Um, well, and there's, there's actually one chapter in this, I'm not going to get too much into it, where it's all together possible that Vladimir Putin has revisited it lately with one of his weapons that he just developed. Or, that he purportedly just developed. That's a cliffhanger. There's a cliffhanger for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, time for another question. Yeah, Way is back in the building. Is there any? This is my first question. Is there any chance that you would do another book about maybe things that were slightly less crazy but actually did end up going in the field or something like that? Like say that they cut open a horse or something and something, <laughs> know, something like that. Is there any chance of that? Well, the wonderful thing is that we have a museum full of that. And that's what that's what kind of the wonderful dichotomy, or the wonderful, let me not use that word, uh, the wonderful mixture of the book and the museum is that right now, in this museum, you're seeing two full floors of things that weren't quite as crazy. And some of them that are kind of, you know, Goldmark Explorers are an example of this. That actually happened. Uh, and, and that's where this book is a good part of that, of things that didn't quite make it to the museum because there's no artifacts, because there's no plan, there's no actual endpoint. You know, so if you, a lot of these things started like this and ended up working, and that's why they're on the wall here in the museum. That's why we're telling those stories, like the SR-71. Like a lot of the gadgets, I hate that word, but we use it in our first gallery where we kind of look at some of the different technologies that these agencies developed for these kind of missions. Um, in many cases, the stories that become famous as huge successes for intelligence agencies could have found their way into this book if it wasn't for luck or happenstance, kind of like what we just talked about. So yeah, there's a museum full of that stuff that you're sitting in right now. Um, so I guess it's a wonderful partnership, I think, with the book. Let me close with uh, just a comment for, for Vincent, for all of you. If you enjoyed hearing about some of these stories, there, there's two things better than that. One of them is getting the book and reading all the stories. <laughs> the only thing that's even better than that is getting the book, reading all the stories, after having Vince sign the book for you outside. <laughs> so please, take advantage of the opportunity, ask Vince other questions, get your book signed, and thank you for attending and for your questions.